We are live. This is 2OF Entertainment. Here we are. We're back. We're live. Kind yeah. of. How are you doing? Yeah, we, we are very alive in this kind. Yeah. But and I must say, <clears throat> today is Thanksgiving. Not today, but you know, it's Hollywood Thanksgiving. Um, so happy Thanksgiving to everybody that's watching this in America mm -hmm. and to our friends in Canada. We're sorry for Mr. Trump. Um, <laughs> so, sorry for the tariffs, guys. Um, mm -hmm. So all the art you're seeing, buy now because next year it's going to be 25% more expensive. So there Actually, you go. more expensive for you. Yes. Yeah. Right. No, that's what I'm saying. It'll be more expensive. I'm saying buy now because it'll be more expensive it's for us. Canadian dollars. So we're about even. So we'll buy, I'm going to say it'll even itself out with the dollar being stronger. For you, anyway. <laughs> for me, for me, it's great. For everybody else, not so much. But anyway, oh, so it'll be fun. But today we have an interesting in, artist. Yeah. I got excited. You said his name was Leonard. I figured Leonard Bernstein was going to be on. And wow. then I realized he's dead. So that didn't work for me. And then when I saw Leonard, who's coming on, you look like Steve Wynn. So I thought maybe you were pulling a fast one. We're going to have Steve Wynn on, talk about gambling and his art collection. And then Leonard came on and we spoke to him and I was like, nope, that's the other Leonard, who's our real artist, who's a watercolorist. So I'm very excited yeah. about this. Yeah, and so. he doesn't have pointy ears either. So we got yeah. that one figured out as well. So. Right, so we got him, right, he's, not, he's, he's <laughs> not playing Spock, right? So we got all of that. So, but yeah, I've seen his work. It's absolutely gorgeous. Looking forward to uh, hearing his story, yeah. so. Well, Leonard, Leonard Paul is going to be with us. He's a uh, First Nations artist from Halifax, uh, Nova Scotia. So uh, we're going to go through a little bit about how his changes are and some of his, I guess, identity, cultural aspects of his art and how things are changing. Um, he's uh, classically trained as an artist as well. So we're going to see how that transitioning is happening. And we're going to talk and show some of this amazing art that will just make you your jaw drop. It just there's yep. some there's some amazing pieces here and we're really looking forward to what he's going to be doing in the next 15 20 years because uh he's setting his his eyes sight and uh i guess in a direction where he wants to go and we're going to talk to him about his journey so uh let's bring cool. uh, leonard in there you go leonard welcome to the show welcome good to be here good yeah. to be here yeah. very cool all right, it gentlemen, is. I'm going to let you speak because nobody wants to hear me go pretty colors all day. So enjoy. I will be back at the end to ask my famous questions that all the artists can never answer. So mm. it'll be fun to ask that. So enjoy your interview. Have a wonderful show. See you at the end. Cheers. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good day to you, sir. How are you doing? Oh, it's great, Paul. It's good to be uh, here in front of you. <laughs> well, we share the same name in some context, in the name of Paul and Paul. So we're... We won't forget each other's names anyway, I guess. That's for sure. Yeah, we're off the bat. <laughs> Going that way. Well, I, I introduced you. I mean, you're talking about uh, your First Nations artist out uh, of Halifax. And uh, we had an earlier conversation about how you're transitioning and changing between your traditional um, making of artwork. And now there's a cultural aspect that is coming into your, you know, your being as far as what are you going to paint and why you paint and do those things. Can you give us a little bit about, the, I guess, the so-called, your art journey up to, kind of up to date, just a, a short, kind of the elevator, the elevator pitch a little bit about where you are now compared where you started and where you are now. How's, can you, can you Oh, yeah. It? Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, when I said I was from, I was born and raised in Halifax. Oh, okay. Yeah, and I now live in Truro, an hour's north of uh, Halifax. Yeah. And um, I guess uh, one can say that I was part of the um, uh, I, uh, the residential school, mm. um, the Black period, we'll call it. Yeah, and uh, my mother was part of that, not me. But I was still affected because uh, when my mother became of age and came, she went to Halifax, and that was their policy. Mm. And uh, she was given uh, 
a train ticket and some money. And, and then they shoved her off to, to Halifax after the residential school. And um, I wasn't born yet. And then she didn't want her future children to be close to the residential school area. So we ended up staying in Halifax when we were born, we stayed. It was her choice. And um, so I grew up a typical person, a uh, little kid just going in, growing up in Halifax and uh, ended up uh, uh, learning everything. And if anything, I, w I was, uh, I had to be quiet about my background. Mm -hmm. So I was a typical kid that uh, grew up at, and went to a Catholic school, Oxford school. And um, it's part of grade four, or not grade four, I mean, when I was around four that I uh, decided to um, scribble on the floor <laughs> and scribble on walls and things like that. And <laughs> my mom <laughs> went out and got a coloring book so I can scribble on a coloring book and, I, I, and um, got me a box of crayons. So from there to university, and after university, I stayed in that realm, in the uh, the classical drawing, okay. and did did uh, art history and so on. When I finished all that, I started questioning about my background, my culture, mm -hmm. and that's what what my mother wanted. It leave it up to me, and then I started to uh, probably in. 30 ish or so, I start questioning about my culture and then what kind of art do we we do, the Mi'kmaq um, uh, culture. You know. And it was a learning process for me, and I'm still learning today. Yeah. No, it's, um, I can't imagine that um, the trauma of your mother, you know, and also having to make those decisions on the welfare of her family. I mean, those are traumatic times. I think as being educated and learning in Canada myself, we were never really aware of this history. It was never really talked about. No, uh, we, had, no. we had none of that. And I and, and so many of my friends, and there's just this obnoxious period of time that uh, actually the world kind of lived through, everything from the States to Canada, even in, around the world. There was just that colonialism that was going on everywhere and it was so-called accepted um as that's the way it is going to be and it's just it's it's brutal anyway art is is art kind of a way for you to find your way out of this and understanding it is that is that kind of where you're going with your discovery and is it about depicting the stories that your mom told about that is it revealing is that is it kind of like undoing an onion skin is it is it kind of Finding those layers? Is that where you're at now? Uh, yes. You know, if um, it's not like I was in a lot of pain, be, pain because if you had pain, um, I got a little dog just came to the studio. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if I had a, if I missed something, which I didn't because I didn't experience it, life on the reserve, life on the First Nation community. So as far as I'm concerned, I was uh, a boy with a, with a dark skin. And that um, uh, when I start unraveling the Halifax, uh, we'll say coat and learning everything, uh, I, I, I started to... Uh, uh, find out if what kind of, I guess I, I looked at uh, First Nations arts and crafts because we never did any drawing. And, and so I started learning through that way <clears throat> as much as I can about the arts and crafts, uh, moccasins, the beadwork, right. basketry and all that. And I had a lot to learn um, to, uh, maybe I was going to incorporate or, or not. I went in direction of illustration you know, right. to get to your question, I, I, I read, uh, my mother gave me a book when I was in high school of uh, Mi'kmaq legends, and I read them, 
and it was written by Silas Rand in the 1800s. So I ended up uh, um, illustrate reading the books and then illustrating the books. Oh, cool! Yeah. And that's what I want to do is to uh, carry on with uh, reading and illustrating and making making up my own stories. Right, uh, big my legends. Yeah. So would these stories be the so-called as true as they can be the true stories and you're you're depicting the story that was told by you or that you've learned i started off that way uh paul yeah. but i'm, I'm kind of leaning towards uh, uh big my legends that uh influence me in other words i ha i have the license to start creating more of the new ones make up stories so that's what i've been doing i've been daydreaming since grade <laughs> seven and grade eight uh, grade nine and uh, daydreaming about fairies and, and uh, giants and all these things and boy, compile them all together and you, it's going to be a, a it sounds fascinating like a big, journey. It sounds like it would be a great book. You know, it becomes down to this idea of publications of yes, you can do a painting and sell it and do those things, but it says how do you compile this stuff into a lyrical story? that actually somebody wants to sit down and, and see how you think and see your stories that you're now telling. Um, and we talked about, you know, the, the stories of Bill Reed, who, yeah, uh, you know, he was so rich with animals and birds and how they interacted with uh, the sailors communities um, in the Haida Gwaii, you know? So, and I can see that is that, kind of where you might be going now not so much in sculpture but in 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 the in the telling of stories of of these experiences say between raven and crow and in in those kinds of things is that kind of i can see myself going in, in that direction i really enjoy the um the the use of my imagination we we're all born with imagination and yeah. i really love the fact of um reading a story and I don't have to stick with it. All right. I have to do is just be influenced and start making up something out of, out of my head. I don't even know what I'm going to do when I get behind a drafting table. <laughs> well, I well, know one thing. I, it's going to come out of my head. Yeah. I'm going to get Stephen to start our first image up here and we'll just get people to think, well, oh, yeah. this is an amazing image. I mean, I, I mean, I, I love, you're a realist painter. Yes. So that is, and in watercolor, is this, mm -hmm. Typically, do you paint oils and acrylics as well, or are you just mostly watercolor is most of your, your medium of choice? It's mostly watercolor, never acrylics. I, I don't like the way they look at the end. Yeah. So I, I, and I do the odd oil, and I, I treat oil just like uh, a watercolor. I thin in, them out. You're in thin layers, yeah. 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 No, yeah. You know, so you're not, they don't get opaque and really no. heavy. Yeah, they're running yeah. light color and let the... No, this this is a beautiful... Can you tell us the story behind the image? Because I think you do your own photography as well, correct? Yeah. For reference, so you paint from reference material. So can you tell us a little bit about this guy? And this, I guess it's a coyote. Uh, yeah. 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 Uh, um, I was in the First Nation community in Escazoni, and, uh, and a friend of mine made a headdress and uh, I uh, was admiring it from a distance. And I just loved the way if you didn't see the face, it looked like a real, you know, animal on right. the shoulders. It was beautiful. And, and then I, I put the, but then there's the ad lib or, or the artistic license. He, I put the feathers in myself mm -hmm. and, um, and I, I wanted the, uh, and I made up my own face to put in, but I, I used the, the profile and I just, and what I, I started off at the snout and the eyes and, and the mouth and then I worked backwards. And as I got to his shoulders, I got looser and looser until it just drops yeah. off. No. I, I love the feeling of double face. Animal yes. face, man face, face of man, right? Yeah. The, the stare of their eyes become really, really important. Like, where are they looking? You know, you know, one is actually the guy is steering a little more down and serious than the coyote is looking, right? The coyote, mm. 
the coyote is feeling he's in wonderment of somehow um almost euphoric i guess and the mm. guy is has that very determined feel in in a sense of i guess i don't know if it is of control or domination maybe uh, of some kind yet they both belong together you know when you have man within the coyote is a context that is kind of cool like it's sort of like um the bear has eaten something but it's like the man is still alive but the coyote is somewhat still alive you know they're they're like they belong together I yeah, guess I, yeah. I kind of look at it that way they 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 depend on each other they are one of the same uh within the same body which is kind of cool yeah yeah uh, yes see, yeah go ahead well said yeah i like the touch of the feathers though it it really does help really strengthen that coyote's face because the arch comes right over top from left yeah. to right yeah and you really get a feeling of the coyote i think it it's more than a headdress so uh, in in its context uh, yeah 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 anyway we'll move on a little bit. like okay. i just i wanted to start with this image because it sets the tone for uh, it's my fo my favorite face <laughs> yeah I'm sure it is so this is this is probably your early beginnings you're telling me this is one of your first paintings that you produced yeah um how big is this thing Oh, this one's huge. It's four feet by three. <laughs> as, a water color, as a watercolor. Yeah, it, it's a, a whole arm's length with yeah. this. Uh, I was born uh, not long after the Second World War and Halifax and all the surroundings was old fashioned. So when the war was over, we were starting. I. I sense that we were starting to put our economy into rebuilding up again and so on. So this place here is called Sunnyside and they, they wanted to stop the big trucks to come in in Sunnyside. It was like a truck stop before okay. I was born. And, and it was a truck stop continuing it as a truck stop in the sixties. And then in the seventies, they were now, trying to eliminate the trucks to come in because they had a highway behind it called the, the bicentennial highway and and big truck stops are in the future to be much bigger like um like the irvings truck stops right so knowing the the fate i saw this truck and it was the only truck in the in the parking lot <laughs> yeah and i said this might might be the last truck yeah. So I stayed there and wait till he came to. He, uh, he was eating and he came exactly. out of the, the little yeah. restaurant. And yeah. I got out of the car and I went over to him and I asked him, Will you pose for me, please? And he said, Yeah. I said, I want to capture this truck just in case because um, I didn't see any more trucks after this. And he did. He, he stayed in that position until I got my camera on and uh, went back and I took some shots. He was very accommodating for me. I, I like it when people uh, want to be a part of another of an artist's work. I mean, it's tough. You go and sit in a cafe and try and draw and sketch somebody's drinking coffee or having a conversation with their friends. They feel they look up and they say, stop sketching me or, you know, those things will come out where people don't want you to actually depict them. But when other people want to be a part of and not in a arrogant way or anything, they just, yeah, I'll, I'll participate with you, you know, and. And it was good that he was able to do this for you because I think it's important to capture those. I guess part of an artist, don't be afraid to ask people. You know, if you yeah. have an idea and the strength of, of conviction of doing something um, and you need participation, in a nice way, ask them how, if they can participate, you know, if it's a photograph or just sit for a quick sketch. Mm -hmm. Anyway, we'll move on here a little. I had to oh. combine these two pieces because of we, we've got a lot of material to go through here. But I, I, I love the fantasial story aspects of both these images. Can you speak to the one on the left? I mean, they're so rich with birds and the element of wildlife um, yeah. and nature. Sure. Yeah. Well, I got my start with birds, appreciation of birds, animals, and so on. I grew up traditionally, even though I grew up off the reserve right. and I grew up in Halifax. It, my father uh, took me out hunting at an early age. 
And uh, <clears throat> so I was always tagging up behind him and we were hunting away. But in the meantime, I was daydreaming. <laughs> I was thinking about, I saw these little mushrooms and, and uh, fungus of all sorts and so on. And I was making up stories. So there again, so I was influenced and using my imagination and so on. So this is what I did. Uh, right. Kind of like, kind of like um, going back in time when I, when I start planning and drawing on my watercolor paper. And this is a shelf mushroom, we, we call it. Right. And I just remember all the birds, especially the thrush and, and these ones that sound like flutes. So uh, I made up a little story, and so I hear these songbirds are coming in and uh, listening to the little flute player. So I call it the magic flute player. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, it has a, a fa very much a fairy tale fantasy feeling, um, but in a, Cana in, what, in a Canadian sense, though. Right? We have this, the foliage, it's not, it's not of Europe. You know, it's not, a, it's not of Disney. You know, that's just, no. it doesn't have that feeling. This is... This has got an original feeling to it as well. The one on the right is is uh, that that is a story. Yeah, and I stuck with this one close to the story in the book, Mi'kmaq Legends. Okay. And uh, actually, there there's another one I haven't done it yet, but there's another one. This one's called the Bird Tamer, and then the other one in the same story is called the Animal Tamer. So. Here, um, I I don't know if there's a name for it, whatever. But these birds are big, and he's talking to them. Well, in the the world of imagination, a lot of these uh, figures could be have magical powers and shrink shrink up, or the bird the animals can get bigger or smaller, and so on. But anyway, these two brothers, they were poor, and so they drew straws and one got the animals, the other one got birds. So this is the bird one. And he's talking to the birds, convincing them to try to sell themselves to the town. And then <clears throat> he'll collect the money. And then in the evening when everyone's sleeping or whatever, they fly off. And then he keeps the money and they do it all over again. And so they're, they're like little, um, it was like a little scam going on you know, <laughs> in a way. And, and, yeah. and uh, they were very poor. They had, they were always looking for uh, food, clothing and so on. And uh, yeah, the yeah, other so brother was the same too. It's a nice analogy. You know, it's, a, it's yeah. nice how the story ties together. But I, I had a little story where I went to uh, um, one of our first nations, uh, communities and it was uh, it's called one is when it's uh it's like a museum and it overlooks a buffalo jump and one spring i was there and walking down the path there was a whole bunch of birds like small little um i don't know what they would be um lack of words here but anyway there was a an asian fellow and he was blowing a reed of grass you know how you put the grass between your thumbs oh yeah yeah, yeah. and he was he was yeah. blowing this reed of grass and these birds, it was like a symphonic thing. They couldn't stay away from him. They were all around him and everybody who was on the pathway stopped and watched us. And he was, he was laughing so hard. He could hardly blow the, the grass <laughs> and the birds were just all, I could have never seen anything like it. it was just like magnet to him. Right. Wow. He was one with the birds at that moment. And it was, it was a very special, uh, special, I guess a symphony almost of him putting on this and he did it for about five minutes. It was, wow. pretty, it was very amazing. Uh, but it was all done with that blade of grass and between his thumbs and, and he just blew on that. This, so this is continuing what we're talking about, a storytelling. Yeah. We did an enlargement on the right. Of yes. The character in behind. This is your grandson, correct? Yeah, this is, yeah, this is my, my grandson. I, he inspired me. I, I used my grandchildren uh, as models, including myself. I'll, I'll use myself as, as, as models as well. But this, my grandson was having breakfast, so he was still in his PJs. So I left him in his PJs. And he's reading a book on uh, Mi'kmaq legends, stories, 
and I love storytelling. So what I did, I, I, I uh, went inside his head and I, I grabbed all kinds of things that he was talking about and reading. And, uh, and then I just took them all out and I put them all around him. So yeah. that's Goose Cap up there that looks like a mountain lion and, or a tiger. But, and then the wolf on the right is Melson. His, his kind of like a new, they're both chip, say, shape shifters, but uh, the one that's kind of like the good against the, the bad force. And uh, Goose Cap, uh, of course, is the good shape shifter and the Melson is the, the wolf. And uh, in the face with the bear cap is uh, a shape shifter, a medicine man. And uh, again, I'm, I'm incorporating the, the little magic flute player on the left there by, uh, by his head there. Yeah. And uh, the Gugwis is the giant down by his legs. And these are opposing forces in the forest with, uh, with the Mi'kmaq people. And it's almost biblical in the way, you know, you have these opposing forces, Satan and so on. We had, we had powers in the woods that were not, were not good. And uh, the, uh, the, the fall on by his feet is a giant. He stands around 30 feet tall and he's uh, a cannibal and, and he goes around and, and he's inflicting a lot of terror in the countryside. Yeah. You know, it's a nice, uh, it's a nice collage. It's it's really hard sometimes to collage a number of faces and figures together into a coherent visual image that you can understand. And you can understand that these images are part of the young boy's imagination. It does come across, it does come across nicely with that. And the detail on the right was just, it's amazing detail on that face. Like it's beautifully crafted, I guess I'll say. Thank you for for doing that it's beautiful yeah oh thank you yeah so we're gonna move on here we just talked can you tell us a little bit about um this major project that you just kind of just completed yes um i did a <clears throat> i work with uh, national parks canada and uh my job was to supply murals for the new Mi'kmaq wing in the um Fortress, sort of the Hill Fortress Museum. And it's, it's in quite Hall large. This is in it, it's, it's very, it's very big. And I, I mean, I didn't see it complete until it was actually done. I mean, there were a lot of things in there too, not just my paintings. And, mm -hmm. and, and you, it's, you have to go around hallways and so on and, and that and everything was placed beautiful beautifully and you read and go along and my paintings were strategically placed along the way right yeah how many pieces how did you paint in that sir in this um i'm guessing probably six or eight 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 pieces i did some extra ones too so how and how long did you work on this project if the project took well I think they said that it was the largest project that at that time in all of Canada, but this was a whole, uh, the revamping was taken up about three years. Holy smokes. Okay. Yeah. 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 No, uh, the, the display system itself. So are these digitally produced from your artwork? Uh, on yes. The yeah. Okay. So they're yeah. the, the artwork is, uh, is safe in the vault and and uh, these were taken from the, the right. images yeah, yeah. Well, so one of the key points i just saw is 1748 um on the i can't read all the type that's on there so the what is the context of that date uh we all we we sent it around and we basically with the help and the understanding of uh the I guess, uh, Parks Canada and Mi'kmaq Confederacy, we, we worked together and, and it took a lot of, uh, uh, oh, I, 
I was so impressed with, with the staff on both sides. They were so helpful because I came in green. One is I didn't know the rifles of the soldiers of 1749 when Halifax was just starting to uh, come around and, and it was going to be a force of um, being the, yeah. uh, the major city as it is today. Yeah. And then the, we wanted, though, to have the Mi'kmaq have the first and the, and the main say from our side of what we thought what 1749 treaty was going to be about and how it's going to affect us. And, yeah. uh, and also the, um, a lot of bad things happened during that time too. Yeah. And yeah, it's part of that. I think, you know, that, yeah, it was early stages of colonialism and, yeah. And yeah. appropriation of, land and just the way oh Europe did it you know it was unfortunate it was basically like war you know you come, yeah. in, you come in and take and if nobody says you can't have it then you fight <laughs> and then and then you they come back and forth I mean we that's what our history is all about mm -hmm. aggressions but it's a beautiful piece and I think I encourage people that if you're in the Halifax area to definitely go through and, and these are the two images that we've got to show you but it's uh it looks, if I'm ever back in Halifax again, definitely part of my tour for sure. Mm -hmm. We'll get into some of the these imagery of birds. Uh, is that just one of those loves? I can see you love painting birds in this. And I, oh, yeah. I had to put these two together here just due to the number of things we got to get through here in the next few minutes. Um, I love the light on them. I mean, it's not just a, it's a portrait. They seem they seem very portrait like, mm -hmm. and, I, and especially the bird on the right, uh, you know, the blue jay. I, I love that he's trapped between two pieces of wood on the branches, so it's not just a see every feather on the bird. It he's part of nature without showing all the tree, and it's in a minimalist way. Can you speak to some of either one of these birds and how you worked on it, and you know? Your yeah, sure. I, again, when I was at the art college, I took that direction of being a classical trained artist. So I, I, I took art history and um, I was deeply influenced by um, Baroque art. And I, so the bird on the left with the dark background mm -hmm. I incorporated uh, typical s methods like uh, this fumato with soft edges and, and then tenebrism. And I wanted to put all that together for the blue jay on the left that we see here. And that's an oil painting, by the way. Yeah. And the branch is very detailed. And, um, and I wanted to dis disappear in the background, bring in the bird closer to me. The yeah. bird on the right is um, more of a personality. The bird on the right there, he's actually spying on uh, a bird feeder. <laughs> <laughs> and so there are all these chickadees actually about a foot down yeah. below there. And I took a picture and, 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 I, and I drew it. But a lot of people say it's, it's kind of like a, an ambivalent feeling we have 50 50 i think of uh love hate relationship of uh starlings or our blue jays because they come in and they're very robust yeah. they like to shove all the birds out and, and, and they're a big bird they're a big bird right? yeah 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 they are and they're very very um uh, selfish they just move out of the way i want to eat <laughs> and they're loud yeah they're, yeah they're very chatty well they're all part of that covert family like the crow and the raven they're 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 a relative yes, they of that family and they're a big aggressive bird i know if you don't get the peanuts out in time they they tell you i think yeah <laughs> if you're feeding them but they're a beautiful bird and uh yeah they they does they do cause some havoc with robins and their eggs and different things but i guess that's all part of that nature that goes on yeah yeah here's another one now these this one feels very andrew wyeth to me so it just and i think it's just that it's the foreground and the, the way the treatment is and i think it's just the 
the countryside and the barns and the and and uh, the grasslands are muted, like they're just ochre and 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 soft. The mm -hmm. buildings disappear almost into the sky, and it's really about this event that's happening uh, above the land right here. Can you tell us a little bit about how this came about, and was this actually a real thing, or yeah? This was actually a real event. I had a, a bald eagle on my right as I was coming into Tim Hortons parking lot in Windsor. <laughs> and, uh, I was, and I looked to my right. On my left would be Tim's. I was ready to make a left turn. But I saw some commotion in the trees that we can't see. And here these ravens are not attacking the, the, the eagle. They're just trying to entice the, the eagle to drop which is a piece of muskrat uh, in its claws, right? And and the other would be the other bird will sweep down and, and get it. So they're just heckling the the poor guy. He just wants to eat the uh, yeah. the muskrat. So I didn't know how strong they were. I actually saw the eagle pick up the whole muskrat, and he. Um, he ripped it apart like they're not they're, they're like size, almost the size of a house cat they're big and, yeah. yeah they're really big muskrats and uh, he he took it apart he ripped it apart and he ate it and that's the last of the, that little bit and so the ravens precariously come really close they sit right close to the eagle uh, right. feeding and almost shoulder to shoulder and he, but and then when he flies off, they'll follow him. That's that's yeah. what this whole story was about. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, yeah, there's always a, a give and take when it comes to birds. They're they're always after each other, whether it's a seagull or whether it's uh, uh you know, birds like this that are over the, with the prey. Um and I've seen videos with the, the eagle and they like I said, they're big and strong, and uh the fox is going after the rabbit and that that eagle comes down and picks the fox up hoping that he's going to drop the rabbit and uh, <laughs> that's amazing yeah it's, it's amazing how much strength they have in their wingspan to to give that much lift yeah um, and you will see them with a salmon um just like an osprey they'll they'll put them together and they'll they'll fly off with i don't know how many pounds salmon you know it, it's they're big but uh it's it's nice to see i guess this kind of drama like mm -hmm. um and as an artist a lot of times with photography you you got to be there at the moment to catch stuff like this but as an artist you can depict these things yeah. i feel my like, memory there paul yeah i'll try and i'll try and uh, like you like the camera my my brain's the camera <laughs> yeah. and i'm going click 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 <laughs> yeah trying to remember every everything about this event yeah. So you gave this one more of a rural aspect rather than the Tim Hortons aspect. Yeah. Um, where yeah. It's more of a out in nature that this happens, but we find that I, you know, at our Tim Hortons is in Kentucky chicken and what, but they, they hang around the dumpsters all the time, the Ravens and uh, looking for the scraps of, they know what a McDonald's fries are. They know, what, they, <laughs> yeah. they know what to look for and how to open a bag. I'm I was just completely amazed at, how quickly they can open a bag and know that there's a few French fries in that bag. Oh yeah. That a lot of our birds have turned urban and they learned how to adapt to yeah. not great for their diet, but they've learned how to adapt to living around us. Yeah. Um, and so much. So yeah. Anyway, yeah. I love this. But, yeah. I, love I was going to say, Paul, when this, this painting was finished, the scenery in the background was leveled. Oh really? It, yeah, it was all house, trees, front barns was gone. Wow. Yeah, the I didn't I didn't know who they who lived there and that, but I I, I came back. I was I always had to drive, drive by this Tim Hortons when I go to Halifax, and uh, I looked to my right and it was just gone, nothing but a foundation left. I just. Well, what, what do you feel went on there? Just. I uh, I uh, maybe I I bequeathing people that maybe the children weren't interested in farming anymore and just so, knock everything down yeah yeah uh, you know yeah. that's what i'm guessing but yeah it's just, it's just a field and uh, oh by the way that 
that whole section there was really building up anyway. Uh, okay, so maybe it's planned for urbanization. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. You just sold the farm and because the industry would have come down and knocked it down, getting it ready for that's too yeah. bad it's happening everywhere. Yeah. So uh, I captured it. I, I was so glad that I, okay, so that, that's a nice looking barn farm. <laughs> yeah. It's very nice. And I, and I love the, the wispiness of those trees. I mean, they're yeah. not dominant, but they're there to soften those yeah. verticals and angles of the roofs and the barns. They're just, uh, like I said, it has a very Andrew Wyeth feeling to him. They just, uh, I yeah. think he's done similar pieces at with animal, with the farm of Chatsford area that he raised in. And it looks very much like a very a beautiful piece. So was this a watercolor as well? Yes, this, this was a watercolor. Yeah. It's another one. Yeah. Oh yeah. One of my favorites. Yeah. I, I've always loved the thought of Fox. You know, we live on the edge of the city here and, I actually saw here a couple months ago a fox trotting down the road and going between the houses. Like they're right in our community and coyote as well is coming right in. Uh, and they're not afraid of anything right now, which is kind of worrisome. But uh, can you, this one has a really nice feeling and it's the barrel is the human element to this space. And I, I, I kind of like how you've done this. I mean, we're, we're looking at a, a fox and a pheasant, maybe on the one side. Can you can you tell us how you get that that portrait of that fox in place? Like, sure, I can. I every day mid morning, I, I go for a walk and I take my dog across the street, and this is where the location was up on a hill. And yeah. and every day that my uh, my dog would chase the pheasants he never caught he never caught them <laughs> and uh, i wasn't too worried and i don't know if he would harm them or not but he it was a game and then uh, so we were going around and there was an empty barrel and uh, it was uh winter time but it was springtime actually and and uh, the weather was getting the sun was getting stronger so that i think the barrel was giving off heat that's why the pheasant was there ah uh, okay yeah so when we came around, my dog chased the pheasant out. And I said, wow, this is great. I memorized everything, went back down to the house with my dog, took three dog bones, or uh, yeah, the little cookies. Yeah. And I, uh, I, we went back up there, and I threw about 30 feet away the first dog bone, and then 15 feet, and then the third dog bone, I put it right where that fox is. And, and my dog ate it. And I said, this is it. And I took a snapshot. And then I converted his whole body, my, my dog. And he was a mixed German Shepherd. Yeah. And smaller than a German Shepherd dog. And uh, I changed its whole anatomy and turned it like a metamorphosis. I turned the dog into this fox. Yeah. And then well, uh, I entered it in the ducks the Canadian National Ducks and Limit, and I won the I won the national competition. Nice. Excellent, but I think you you have to think how am I going to get that gesture of that animal there, and using your own dog to that's how you have to think. Like I think you have to think how am I going to carry this off that it looks real and believable, and I think yours was a great solution for the problem that you had to solve is this amazing, you know? And yes, just having that animal looking down, yeah, change it up to a fox or a dog and you, it's, it's a, it's still a major repaint, but it's still, it gives you the idea of what it will look like with the dog looking down. And you don't know the bones there, but it's just sort of, I yeah. love, <laughs> That's right. I love the context though. It's sort of like the pheasants over here, there's a barrel in between, but the fox hasn't seen the pheasant. So he's got something more interesting than the pheasant where he is, which is kind of a contradiction. It's just like, uh, yeah. I think it's, you know, it's like, there's a story here. Like, it's just an amazing secret story. And the pheasants kind of doesn't know that the fox is there. It's like these, they're both, <laughs> they're separated by this barrel. It's, it, it, it makes me ask questions is what it does. Just, oh, yeah. 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 It, that's what I like about it. This narration is right in front of us. And we... In, we, you know, make up our own story by just looking at this. Yeah. Yeah. No. 
Yeah, you're continuing as when you were a child and you're, you're doing, yeah. you know, this part. Yeah. yeah. He's a, this is a great raven. Yeah. I, I really like the branch though. It's just like, so what do you, what do you do? Okay. I'm, you know, people can paint things. I said, again, you're back to how do I position these things? How do I, how do I make a unique image? Is this like a full sheet of paper as well? Is it a full? Yes. So 2230 watercolor paper regular Pretty close stuff. yeah yeah so what do you do for like the branches do you have that separately on your table and your desk and you look at it and i don't know what you're referencing for the the raven but yeah the i got that from the halifax museum the raven and, and well it was actually a crow but i converted yeah. it into a raven because it made the uh, the the beak uh broader and and fuller yeah he's got a, a point here yeah. yeah yeah and then um the branch i went out in the backyard and i just went around the around the uh, we got a lot of trees around our property and uh what i did was i uh looked for a branch and then i found one and i uh i i um uh, duct taped it at the end of my drafting table and the one right behind me is the table and i just duct taped it to the position where I think the raven will fit on it nicely, and I, I and I just pieced it together. I'm always incorporating things. Uh, I'll I'll use a little kid riding a bike in one of my water. It I may not even be looking for it, but it just inspires me. And then to see a branch uh, in this one, I'll incorporate it and put it all together. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No. I like and you and. Funny thing went through my head when you said you duct taped this thing to the your thing. And all I think right now is that darn banana where people are <laughs> duct taping yeah. that, that yeah. one banana. So they think, like, oh God. Yeah. yeah. As as a funny scenario, you could see that where the, the raven sitting on the duct tape banana to the wall, right? Yeah. <laughs> Instead of the branch. But it's just kind of no, he's you know what it's the feeling of um there's a starkness of the darkness of the bird, but I, I love the feeling of the feathers and the feathers and the texture of the wood. They belong together. Like they, mm -hmm. they're natural and they, they're aging and they're both um, natural elements and they feel like feathers. They feel soft and they feel like they're supposed to feel yet. The branch feels gnarly. If I grab that branch, I feel it would, it's not slick and shiny and it's, it has a feeling of, uh, of, of that tree. It's, I love it. And it's just that little touch of ochre warmth under the, the bird's feet. Yes. Kind of, yeah. It kind of warms that whole page up, you know, you know. Yeah. yeah burnt sienna is one of my favorite colors. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's, it, it has great depth to it. You know, that color, you can, can move it around a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So this one's quite different from your other pieces. It's just, mm. it has a very, uh, um, it's kind of majestic and it's, uh, some, I guess, simpler in design. Um, is, was this a direction you just went for a little while and, or is this something that you've always kind of, uh, it, of you know, you're, where you're going? I, uh, I this, this was, uh, in the BC, we we're coming into BC in that season. They were experience, experiencing 136 forest fires. Oh, I know. Yeah. Yeah. Lots of fires. Unbelievable. And so this is a, actually where you and I are looking at that standing. That's the rest area where we all the cars can pull over and, yeah. and just take a breather and walk their dogs. And I was doing that, and I looked right straight across, and the smoke from the forest fires from the states and – and you could smell it. Oh. It may, ironically, things look kind of really pretty, you know. <laughs> yeah, the, the the haze. Yeah. So the mountains way off in the distance were 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 fade. They were faded more, and then as you get closer, the, the density gets a little more uh, concrete looking, and and uh, so that big mound there's a clo obviously a closer mountain, and I just like the way it, it struck me. Yeah. The, the the different um fade, yeah. the fading uh abating as it gets closer to us and then to the trees right in front of us yeah 
yeah for um it's almost like a big fog you know dealing yeah. with fog as well and i know in halifax you get fog there from time to time yeah yet you know when we go to this picture it's highly realistic painting um beautiful I, I just love the depth in the water on this one you know you don't have to i always find you, you don't have to reflect everything on the the shore to give you a feeling of water and that it's a bright sunny day and that there's some um, this got such deep rich shadow areas and uh you know the fallen log the log of the uh tree with all its branches sticking down it just it's uh Yet you have that new life is coming up from behind it. So yeah. there's a rebirth feeling in it as well. It's just kind of a, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a gorgeous piece. Very rich looking. Is that a full sheet as well? It's kind no, of a, no, it's a quarter sheet. Quarter sheet. Yeah, quarter sheet. But uh, I just pulled over. No, I drove actually. I drove by it, and I just it was right by the road. I call it the road was called. Uh, Route 311. So I call this painting uh, Route 311. Yeah. And it's a watercolor. It, and it was that rock right in the middle that mm -hmm. made me stop. And I turned around and and uh, I, I was on my way somewhere uh, to a meeting. And I took a picture oh, because of that rock. I, I really love that rock and the sun hitting it. Again, there's that incorporating the dark background adding that mysterious where is that brook coming from you know what direction and so on but it's all hidden in the darkness yeah. and the rock is uh, the center piece of uh to attract your eyesight i like that it's a gorgeous piece yeah very nice there's another one of the a brook and water, a little bit of a, you know, cascading water coming down the hills. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's like a little hidden pocket. And this was a minute out from uh, Halifax Armdale Rotary mm -hmm. and uh, Long Lake. And this is the little fall. And I just liked it. It's just a small little piece. Yeah. And uh, like that big tree that's coming up and the big you and, that's the, it's kind of a J that's sticking up there. Right? Yeah, yeah. It can make, kind of makes you wonder how those trees hang on to, to the ground, right? And they they adapt, you know, and they're, they're washing away underneath, and the roots are showing. Yeah, the roots are showing. Still hanging yeah. on. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't, I, don't, I wouldn't be. Oh, I don't know. Maybe that tree may may not be there because, like you said, the roots were exposed, and it's just a matter of time before the yeah. wind takes them. It washes out yeah no and uh water and waterfalls are they're difficult to paint sometimes they're just you know less is more ha uh, the gesture of water is you know where the rock is yet you don't see the rock and you you know how you depict that it's rocky underneath that water without showing the rock and that's uh, yeah it's a it's a challenge for some people i think yeah just practice practice mm -hmm. And this is uh, one of the last images. We ended on this one. It's just, again, it's it's a bright sunny day. And it's uh, here, in, here in Saskatchewan, it's a bright sunny day, but it's minus 27 this morning. So, <laughs> Oh, boy. So it's kind of nice to look at this nice warm picture here. And I'm just kind of, yeah, yeah. You know, I want to sit there with my lawn chair and just and, and enjoy my coffee. Yeah. And, yeah. So this is another another creek bed that uh, in, the, in the Halifax area as well, or is it? No, this up towards my area, it's it's called Salt Springs. And uh, where you and I are standing looking at that is actually, there, there were two rivers that split up and they joined up again. And, and we're, we're standing at the connection where the, it looks like a letter Y if you look down. Okay. And, and it's just outside of Toro. Yeah. And... Uh, I like the, I exaggerate, by the way, uh, again, artistic license, the darkness. Oh. I, I, I do like color, I, like the blue works because the, the banks are very almost blackish and it exaggerates the, the mood. So do you feel that some of these images that you paint, like you're painting landscape, mm -hmm. wildlife, um, 
cultural figures. Yeah. Um, how how are you are you incorporating these things more into your new direction of, um, I guess your cultural aspect of what you're going to be painting? No, I actually I'm sort of I seem to be going away from it a bit. But mm -hmm. you won't. I find these. Uh, paintings of the rivers and the brooks by themselves, very romantic. They're very, uh, I'm trying to work on human moods right. uh, to make you feel kind of uh, lost into the, looking at the painting. Whereas uh, the Mi'kmaq legends and all that, they're, they're, uh, they're storytelling and yeah. they're, they're, there's a narration behind it all. And so, where, so where is this going to go? Like, where, where do you have a vision as to this body of work that you're working on? Where do you feel it's going to be displayed or shown? Or is it going to be somewhat like the cultural piece that you just finished doing for three years in the museum, in the set at all? Yeah. Or is it going to be more... A book or do you do you feel that it is there going to be a Mi'kmaq um, well at some point that where this stuff might be shown I always thought that it's a good question Paul because I've been painting for 45 years and I always thought I had to take one side and I went nah actually there's two sides of me yeah. I grew up in the white society and I learned everything in that perspective. And I, I now have about half of my journey with the uh, Mi'kmaq legends. And, and so I'm incorporating the two and I'm now working on a coffee table book on my paintings. Right. And I'm, I'm going to have the two, it's the name of the book that I, uh, it would be the art of Leonard Paul, and then it's going to be the best of two worlds, the world that I grew up in, and influence in my as a child, and then as an adult, appreciating use of my imagination, and and so I'm going to stick with my rivers and brooks, and I'm going to stick with the legends. I think I think there's probably funding money to make your publication if you through Ottawa and through the arts. Um, councils, so you can probably make. I'll look for them. <laughs> yeah, you can probably make application for that because I think it's valued, and I think it uh, it's 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 historical history that even if it's fantasial a little bit, that needs to be out there. Mm -hmm. I think it's important. Yeah. Information. Okay, go ahead, Stephen. What do you? I'm just you I'm do? just here. I'm just like I enjoyed. Listen, it was yeah. beautiful art. I enjoyed it. I'm like He's sorry that it's over. I can He's like sit in pre-holiday mode. You're in pre-holiday mode. I know. I am. I am. I'm in. I'm in a lot of mode, but it's not holiday mode. Um, <laughs> so, Leonard, here's the question we ask all the artists: If someone wants to buy some of your work, what's the price range? From what to what? Uh, the price range starts around five hundred. Okay. And the big ones, uh, full watercolor sheet, are twenty thousand. Okay. Yeah. So five five hundred Canadian to twenty thousand. So the for the people in the US, six, seven dollars. And for the people with the Euro, <laughs> Leonard will owe you money, but he charges a lot for shipping. So we break even. So there you go. So very nice. All right. Just wanted to make sure. Well, because what ends up happening is is people will see this. Um, and then yeah. they're always like, This is wonderful. And then we get emails, what's it cost? And I'm like, so after a few of those, we're like, we're just going to ask the artist. So yeah. better than, so if someone sees something they like and they know it's between 520,000 and 20,000 Canadian, they can make a determination now if they want to spend between 500 and 20,000 Canadian. Yeah. And there you go. Yeah, I just go by uh, the workload and the right. big ones are, like when I do the waterfalls, I'm, uh, I'm pretty crippled up. I really work for it. <laughs> all right. <laughs> My so hands are go. all, all yep. gnarly and... Yeah. And so on. And the, the five or six hundred are mostly studies. Okay. But they're nice little gems. I, I, I like them, the little yeah. ones, because I put I, I, I do put a lot of little stuff in with a little one eighth of a uh, watercolor sheet. Uh, right. 
these small pieces and so on. But and also with humility, I, I say that the big ones, they they're far wide in between on sales. You know, you don't right. get they don't. I wish they come to my door every day, but <laughs> right. they don't. But they well, do go. After, and, after this, they will. Because uh, the fans will flock. So there you go. But no, your stuff was absolutely gorgeous. I love the, the Eagles and the Indians and the prize. Just, ah, oh, it is a beauty. I'm sorry, oh. I can't say Indians. Amer and indigenous, whatever they are this week. I, yeah. um, yes. I still That's call them saying. Indians at times. Good enough. Yeah. If he can call them Indians, I can call them Indians. Yeah. So anyway, <laughs> so yeah. So the, those, those, that was just absolutely wonderful. Everything, absolutely gorgeous. Oh, um, thank you. And so yeah, as you do more stuff, let Paul know. Come back and share it with us, please, because um, yeah, if he gets the coffee table book, book. yeah, yeah, especially if you do the coffee table book, yes. he'll flog it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. We'll shamelessly plug it because yeah, you know, we, we have no shame. So that's yeah. just the way it is. Oh, so. that'd be, yeah. yeah. Okay. So everybody, if you need to reach out to Leonard and want to buy some of his work earlier, we showed you the link. You can't figure it out. Reach out to us at the show. We will forward the information um, so Leonard can get it. Um, we'll be back next Thursday with another Canadian artist. And to everyone in America, happy Thanksgiving. Thank you for watching. And for everyone else around the world, happy Thursday. And we'll be back next Thursday. Paul, always good to see you. Leonard, good to see you. Yeah. Um, a pleasure seeing your work and getting to know you. And that's it, guys. Don't forget to subscribe and like. We'll see everyone uh, next week. Cheers, Cheers everybody. Cheers. Okay, thank you. Take care, everyone. Thank you.